We'll go to John 15 together. We've been here for several weeks now, just in this one spot, worth our consideration. And if you'll remember, as we read through and have spoken the last few Sundays, I didn't deal directly with Jesus' words in verses 7 and 8 and verse 16 in particular, where Jesus makes a pretty extravagant promise about prayer. Well, I wasn't skipping that because I was afraid of it. I was skipping it because I wanted to save it. As we looked at this passage together, let me, let me begin just again. Let me read through this segment beginning with verse 1 of John 15. Jesus, on his way to the cross, is saying, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he's cast forth like a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and, and they're burned. And again, we see the limitation of a metaphor. It wouldn't make much sense for Jesus to talk about branches that aren't connected to the vine anyway being burned up. So, so that's what gets us confused a little bit here. Are these, is he talking about people that are truly Christian and have lost their salvation? That, that's not, that doesn't fit with the passage at all. But there are those in proximity to Jesus that look like they're following Jesus, look like they're in Jesus that prove not to be. His own disciples have just witnessed that moments before with the departure of Judas, who is preparing to betray Jesus. But verse 7, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done to you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me. But I have chosen you and ordained you, set you apart, that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you that you love one another. We've seen already that Jesus called us to look at this vine. He's using this picture. He wants them and us to see it differently. Again, throughout the Old Testament, the imagery of the vine always pictured the nation of Israel. And it was always in a negative light with the fruit being produced was not the fruit that God desired. Jesus here says to his disciples, I am the true vine. Connection to God is through Jesus Christ. I'm the true vine. My father's the, the vine dresser, the, the, the gardener, the, the one that's tending to the production of what goes on. So he calls us to abide in him. And then starting around verse 9 or so, he takes that metaphor and just 
kind of steps aside from it. It's still in our minds, but he begins to explain further what he's talking about. It's a picture of the vital, life-giving relationship that we have with him. And again, that's where that picture of a vine, it's helpful in some aspects because it pictures the necessary connection we have with Jesus. If we're not vitally connected with him in real relationship, then nothing of any eternal value is going to be brought forward. But where a vine is limited in its picture is a vine can't picture a relationship of mutual love and mutual friendship and mutual companionship and fellowship is the word I'm looking for. So he expands a little bit to help us see the kind of relationship that he's talking about. He's called us to abide in him. Let's look at this vine and then let's live life in this vine. And we've spent time over the last two Sundays to talk about what that means, living in this vine, living in relation to Jesus, in connection to Jesus. It's a life of love we saw two Sundays ago. It's a life of purpose we saw last week and we consider today that this is a life of prayer. There's a life of prayer. The links... So one writer reminds us between the, the first part of this section and the, the second part are intricate. Both sections talk about remaining, abiding. The first part talks about remaining in the vine. The second part talks about remaining in, in Jesus' love. Both segments here hold up fruitfulness as the disciples' goal, both verse 5 and verse 16. Both segments tie this fruitfulness to prayer. We're going to see that today. Both sections are built around a change in our perspective. Change from old covenant to new. Under this image of the vine, as we said, Israel gives way to Jesus. In the second part, being mere servants, just doing what we're told because we're told, which is required. But being mere servants moves to a relationship of friends where we see God is telling us what he's doing. Jesus tells us what he's doing and why and gives us understanding as his friends. So we've seen that and we focus today on the fact that in Jesus, in connection with this vine, in connection with Jesus, the true vine, I live a life of prayer. Let's consider this together this morning, his command is abide. If you go looking through this passage again, won't read it through again, but if you read through again, what you'll notice is the command that Jesus gives us repeatedly is abide. Abide in me, abide in my love. And then he says, love one another as I have loved you. His command is to abide. What is that? We don't want to get all mystical. Well, abiding is a feeling I have. Well, there will be feelings sometimes, but I've got to tell you, and you know this from personal experience, our emotions will lie to us. And our emotions can be fed in any number of ways. Our emotions are not always trustworthy. It's not just a feeling. Abiding is living in obedient, loving relationship with Jesus Christ. The connections that he makes all through this passage help us to understand that. One writer put it this way, the mutual indwelling depicted by this vine picture, it's not narrowly mystical. Where Jesus talks about abiding in me, remaining in me, he explains it more in verse 9 and following. It's, it's equivalent to doing what Jesus commands. If my words remain in you, that's another way of getting at the same truth. His words must so lodge in my heart and mind that conformity to Christ, obedience to Christ, is the most natural, well, supernaturally natural thing in the world. Conformity in the area, in one area, this writer says, demonstrates conformity in the other. When we, when we can see visible obedience to Christ flowing out of our lives, that can be an indicator of the unseen area of genuine spiritual vitality that's taking place within us. To have Jesus' words remaining in us is to share his mind, his will. I'm caught up into his 
focus on doing the Father's will. So more and more, my prayers are going to be shaped by that desire. Jesus all along in his ministry has been telling us that his desire is to reveal the Father, to reveal God, to share his life and love so that people will be brought into union with him. If I'm abiding in Christ, that's going to be my increasing and growing desire as well. So to abide in Jesus, when we talk about abiding in him, it doesn't have to be mystical in, in, in some way. There's, there's direct connection to him. There's obedience to him. There's love for him. There's a desire to please him and see him living himself out in my life. And that stays and it grows. So as we think about what this means and consider what this looks like a little, a little more, we uh, remind us of part of what we talked about uh, before with, with the, the fact that he says if we're abiding in him, we're going to bring forth fruit. So that's why I have problems with somebody that say verse 6 is talking about somebody losing their salvation because that messes up what Jesus says up ahead of that. Every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, he takes away. But the branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. He says, abide in me. The branch can't bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, the same brings forth much fruit. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you're going to bring forth fruit. That's what he says, there's going to be fruit. So, that brings up a question. You ever, I, I saw somebody posted something last week or, or uh, yesterday I saw it and it says what it's like to be a teacher. It was an elementary school teacher situation and, and essentially it was a video of the teacher just repeating the same instructions four different ways over and over and over and still having the kids get them wrong. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's not unlike preaching sometimes. You kind of feel that way. But I, 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 I thought a couple weeks ago and last week that I made this statement, and I still had the same question come up. So I didn't communicate it clearly enough. So, so I'll take another run at it today. What are we talking about when we're talking about fruit? Well, it's not just one thing. There's a broad picture here, but there is an emphasis in the text as well. In verses 7 and 8, we see, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it will be done. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. Verse 5, He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. As we look at, we, we consider, we remember that he desires, we talked about character fruit and ministry fruit. It's all the things that Jesus produces in our hearts and lives as we abide in him is part of the fruit that's going to be produced. Verse 2 seems to say or imply that the one who is in the vine, in Christ, will bear fruit of some kind to some degree and that God is going to work to increase his fruitfulness. I think it's pretty clear. Verse 5 makes it clear that we bear fruit only through Jesus who, along with the Father, wants fruit. Are you sure fruit is that big a deal to Jesus? Well, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 8, verse 16, yeah, I think it's a big deal. He wants fruit. But fruit comes only through our abiding in him. The promise of verse 7 is for those who are in vital, personal relationship with Jesus it relates directly to the production of fruit. Verse 8 tells us that we are set apart for the purpose of fruit that abides, that remains, that lasts, so that we will pray and see the Father respond. A fruitful life of prayer is a life of joy in Jesus, verse 11. So this passage seems to set the objective for my life to grow in fruitfulness for God's glory. So that's what abiding in Jesus looks like. That's what it's going to produce. I'm going to be growing in fruitfulness for God's glory. And that's my desire. Verse 4 is the first command, and it is to abide 
in Jesus. Verse 9 commands, abide in my love. Verse 12 commands, love one another as I have loved you. So it seems that my objective, which is to bear lasting fruit to the glory of God, is the result of obedience to his command to abide in him, in his love, and to love his people as he loved me. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So love God supremely, love others sincerely. Boy, does that sound familiar. Isn't that perfectly consistent with the first commandment? The greatest commandment and the one that Jesus said is like it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength and love your neighbor as yourself. We see the same thing here. It's part of what it means to bring forth fruit. So that we should go and bring forth fruit in two senses. One said the graces of personal character. These are often the means of successful evangelism, by the way. And without them, a man in the highest office is nothing but a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, like Paul said. But also, in verse 16, there seems to be an emphasis on conversions to God. People being converted to relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Carson said there's been considerable considerable dispute over the nature of the fruit that is envisaged here. The fruit we're told is obedience or new converts or love or Christian character. These interpretations reduce it down too much. The branch's purpose, verse 5, is to bear much fruit. But the next verses show that this fruit is the consequence of prayer in Jesus' name and is to the Father's glory. That suggests... That the fruit in this picture represents everything that is the product of effective prayer in Jesus' name. Including obedience to Jesus' commands. Is that fruit? Yes. Experience of Jesus' own joy. Growing in the joy of Jesus Christ. Is that fruit? Yes. Growing in love for one another who are in Christ. Is that fruit? Yes. Witness to the world. Is that fruit? Yes. This fruit is nothing less than the outcome of persevering dependence on the vine, driven by faith, embracing all the believer's life and the product of his witness. Okay? So you've heard me say, now three times in a row, when we're talking about fruit... There is a broad sense in which this idea of fruit and fruitfulness and bringing forth fruit encompasses everything that Jesus is doing to make us look more like him. So as I see myself desiring to go deeper in his word, as I see myself learning to obey him better, as I see myself finding more joy in his things than in the things of the world, is that fruit? Yes, And when we get to verse 16, and John's still talking about fruit, there seems to be an emphasis in verse 16 on a particular aspect of fruit. Not excluding the others, but emphasizing one aspect. Again at verse 16. You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you, and ordained you, set you apart, that you should Go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, so that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. There seems to be an emphasis in verse 16 on the aspect of fruit production that is conversion of other souls to Jesus Christ. So he wants to produce this in our lives. So so what does that mean? On the one hand... I want us to take courage and comfort by saying, if I've not led somebody to faith in Christ, if I've not led somebody to Christ yet, maybe even in my life, if I've not yet done that, that doesn't mean that I'm not in Christ. And that doesn't mean that there's been no fruit. Take courage in the fact that Jesus is conforming you to his image and making you, you you see internal spiritual growth more and more. Take courage in that. Take comfort in that. But maybe what our group needs a little more, perhaps, is a little bit of a push the other way. 
If you've not been used to the Lord to bring someone to faith in Jesus, if you're not leading someone to follow Jesus, does that bother you at all? Because that is a big part of why Jesus didn't just knock you in the head and take you to heaven the moment you got saved. You're still here. Because you are God's instrument of grace to somebody. Several of us have had conversations over the last few years where I've reminded you and told you there are people in your life whom you are better equipped to shepherd than I am. There are people that you can reach for Christ that I will not be able to get to. And that's God's design. That's on purpose. So abiding in Jesus is a living this obedient, loving relationship with Jesus. It's going to result in fruit. He desires character fruit and ministry fruit. He desires fruit that will remain to the glory of God. He wants our fruit to remain, verse 16. One asks the question of what value are the fruits of the Spirit unless they're permanent? Of what value is faith tomorrow if we're, or what value is, is faith today if tomorrow we're unbelieving? Or, or, or love if it alternates with hatred? Or joy if it gets just drowned in despondency? Of what value to a church are converts unless they remain? The curse of modern times is great in gatherings followed by great fallings away. Another reminds us that we need to remember that the fruit that flows out of our obedient faith, union with Christ, lies at the heart of how Jesus brings glory to his Father. Those who are contemplating the claims of the gospel, like John's readers. Maybe some of you here today who are still questioning what it means to be in Christ and follow Christ and what it means to be a Christian we need to reckon with the fact and, and wrestle with the fact that failure to honor the Son is failure to honor the Father. And if we're in Christ, there's going to be fruit. If you're not seeing fruit, you need to question yourself before God. But I prayed a prayer. Don't care. But I had water sprinkled on me as a baby. Don't care. But pastor, you baptized me in that tank. Don't care. Are you in Christ? See, all those things are external. Those things don't change the heart. Are you in Jesus? If you are, there will be fruit. And if there is some fruit, well, <laughs> uh, well you're just never satisfied. You're just always asking for more. Uh, verse 2, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, the Father purges it so that it may bring forth more fruit. Who wants more fruit? God does. And he's going to keep working on us to enable more fruit. He's going to continue that work. So, abiding is living in obedient, loving relationship with Jesus. Abiding results, missed my point here, this is what I've been talking about. A resi- or abiding results in fruit to God's glory. Results in fruit to God's glory. And that actually leads us to the focus I want to get to this morning. Abiding fruit flows naturally into prayer. And it flows from prayer. It's it's back and forth. Is prayer, increasing prayer, part of the fruit that God produces in us? Or is it part of the means that God uses to produce more fruit? The answer class is yes. Right? But this desire to abide in Christ and the fact that I'm abiding in Jesus and drawing closer to him is going to naturally flow into prayer. So let's consider that. His command is to abide. His invitation is to ask. 
And as we've said already, this flows from our abiding with Jesus. There is a direct connection. There's a direct connection. Oh, let me, I, I missed a couple here I wanted to mention. These all kind of go together. This is one of those, I know where I want to get to, my outline's going to mess me up a little bit. But this flowing from our abiding with Jesus, these, these closing words in verse 16 remind us that, that the means of the fruitfulness that I've been chosen is prayer in Jesus' name. One, one said this powerfully, to preach the word and not to follow it with constant and fervent prayer for its success is to disbelieve its use, neglect its end, and to cast away the seed of the gospel at random. See, believe it or not, sometimes I include things in my sermon that convict me. pull me up short, cause me to stop. I'm thankful that throughout the history of our church, we've, we've had people that will gather before a Sunday morning service and get together and pray for the service. I'm thankful for that. Don't stop doing that. That's good. And may your tribe increase. But how much intentional time and effort do we spend as individual believers or as a church praying for the word after it's gone out? This invitation from Jesus is to ask and it flows from our abiding with Jesus. There's a direct connection between how we pray and the primary commitments of our life. And Jesus here demands that the fundamental commitment of a disciple's life is abiding in him. It's Borchardt who said that means that the model of Jesus in life and word needs to permeate the life and words of the disciple. And when that happens, praying stops being selfish asking and becomes aligned with the will and purposes of God in Jesus Christ. Abiding in the vine, praying in his name, implies that I've become aligned with the spirit and nature of Jesus so that I'm requesting something, so that requesting something out of line with the nature of Jesus would be completely excluded from consideration. There's a book by Paul Miller, not that Paul Miller. Paul E. Miller called A Praying Life, and in it he, he reminds us that there's a mystery to prayer. Let me, let me share a couple thoughts from him that I appreciated. He said, what do I lose when I have a praying life? That's an interesting question. What do I lose when I have a praying life? Control. Independence. See, right there, that's why a lot of us have trouble praying. But what do I gain? Friendship with God a quiet heart, the living work of God in the hearts of those I love, the ability to roll back the tide of evil. Essentially, I lose my kingdom and get his. I move from being an independent player to a dependent lover of God. I move from being an orphan to a child of God. He writes, suffering is God's gift to make, aware, make us aware of our contingent existence. He creates an environment where I see the true nature of my existence, I am dependent on the living God. But how God actually works in prayer is largely a mystery. The assumption, I love this, the assumption that we can figure out how everything works comes from that enlightenment mindset that says everything is matter and energy. Well, that definition of everything leaves out all the important things of life, like love and beauty and people. The most precious things in life can't be proven or observed directly, but we know them as surely as we know that the sun and moon exist. Prayer is strikingly intimate. As soon as you take a specific answer to prayer and try to figure out what caused it, you lose God. The only way to know how prayer works is to have complete knowledge and control of the past, present, and future. In other words, you can figure out how prayer works if you are God.
So the invitation from Jesus is to ask. This flows out of our abiding. So he says to ask. And he says that these are extravagant promises and they make us nervous for a lot of reasons. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done for you. Really? Does he mean that? You say, well, that hasn't been my experience. Well, mine either in many ways. So what does that mean? Well, the invitation is ask, and it flows from our abiding with Jesus. And let me get a couple things here. This, I'm going to throw two of these up here at once because they kind of go together. This, this requires exercise. We must ask. And this requires examination. Why do we ask? It was Miller who pointed me to this example of, of how Jesus is, is a perfect example of the kind of response that Jesus desires from us in prayer. See, see, not long after he has this discussion with his disciples, he's going to be in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before his crucifixion, and Jesus is going to spend extended, agonized time in prayer to the Father. And you remember what he prayed? He cries out to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now consider that. Because when Jesus said to Peter, when, when, when Jesus told the disciples earlier on in his ministry, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected by the authorities. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be put to death. And then I'm going to rise again. And Peter said, no, no, no. You're not going to do it that way, Lord. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like people, not like God. And now Jesus, mere hours from the cross, prays to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Did he believe there was another possibility? No. This was the very reason he came. And he'll declare that just not long after that prayer. He knows this is, he, he knows what's happening. But he still asked Father if it be possible let this cup pass from me he asked and only after asking did he say nevertheless not your will not my will but yours be done see we're called to ask see I try to be sometimes I try to be super spiritual when I pray so I will pre-screen my prayer requests well I can't ask that that's not a good request Jesus was real in his humanity in the presence of the Father on the eve of his crucifixion if it be possible let this cup pass from me you don't get more real than that he was real first so he was able to be just as real when he said, nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus provides a great example for us there. But Jesus, I think James, provides some good explanation for us. Because remember what James says about prayer. You fight so hard to get stuff that you're ready to kill somebody and you still don't have what you want. And James said, you have not. Why? Because you ask not. You didn't ask. So if you picture in your mind a, a, a path with a, with a steep ditch on either side and, and, and we can tend to fall off on the don't ask side. We're, we're trying to stay on that path of prayer, but, but we just don't ask. Well, you don't have because you don't ask. But then James follows that up and tells us there's a ditch on the other side too. You ask and don't have because you ask amiss. You ask wrongly that you may consume it upon your lusts. What you're asking is completely and totally selfish. What you're asking is for your own desires, your own agenda, your own way, your own advancement, and that's it. 
I heard one preacher say, God's not going to fund idolatry. So we can fall off on the other side too. Not asking and then asking wrongly. Asking with wrong hearts. But the invitation from Jesus is to ask. Well, well, how can I know that I'm asking with a right heart? How can I ask things that are pleasing and honoring to God? See, that's how it flows out of our abiding with Christ. The closer we are with Jesus, the more we're working with him, the more he's at work in us, the more our desires start lining up with what is pleasing to him. And more and more, we start requesting what we're requesting with him in mind and wanting to see his glory and his purpose advanced. Which means, at some point in our life, we will only ask for spiritual and religious requests. False! Jesus says, ask what you want. With all that appropriate context. But he describes the Father as one who knows how to give good gifts. And we need to remember that our God is a generous God. We sang it this morning. You are coming to a king. Large petitions with you bring. There's the account of Sir Walter Raleigh approaching Queen Elizabeth seeking royal favor from her. And she says to him, Raleigh, when are you going to stop asking for things? And he says, when your majesty stops giving. A um, few months ago, I asked the Lord for hockey tickets on purpose with a straight face. I've told you before how, how well, I mean, I just enjoy going, certainly, to the, to the admirals. I love, love to go. But I wanted to use those as opportunities, too, to take somebody with and have opportunity to build some redemptive relationship around hockey. Something I enjoy, and there's some guys I want to see come to Christ who also enjoy it. And I thought, hey, this may be an opportunity, and I'd like to, to do that. And, and so I asked the Lord. I, I asked him. I'd like to get a flex pack. Could, could we? I don't think it's in the budget right now, but Lord, could, could I get some hockey tickets? A couple days later, my wife says to me, hey, I saw they had the sale on, on uh, the, you know, renewing the membership thing, and you know, we had something in the budget here I hadn't planned on, and it was there, and so I thought I'd go ahead and get them for you. Okay. Well, now that doesn't really count. I mean, you know, the money was there anyway, and you would have gotten those anyway, and whatever. Oh, okay, okay. But I know this. I asked the Lord for that. And I asked the Lord submitting to his will. I asked the Lord knowing full well, hey, this is frivolous. Hey, this is extra. This is far beyond my daily bread. But I know you're good. And I know you're generous. And I believe my heart is right in this. And I'm just going to ask, would you do this? If he says no, well, that's his business. He's a loving father. He, he knows how to give good gifts. And it's right for him sometimes to say no to us. But ask. And sometimes we see him do some things we didn't plan on seeing him do. He is good. He is generous. The invitation is to ask. We see that example from Jesus. We see James with the explanation. And, and so that requires the examination. Why are we asking? What am I about? What's motivating me in my prayers? That leads us to what we need to do, which is apply this. The command is abide. The invitation is ask. So let's apply this command and invitation. Let's apply it personally. Very straightforward here. How's your abiding? How is your abiding? Fruit bearing for God, one writes, is not a human possibility. It is Christ's work through us. The alternatives are starkly expressed. Separate from Christ, no fruit. United to Christ, much fruit. Verse 5. A continual dependence upon a living Savior. 
communing with him through the Holy Spirit and submission to him in all things. These are the characteristics of a life in which God is glorified through the bearing of fruit to his praise. Jesus makes clear, however, that this relationship is a moral one. If you obey my commands, you'll remain in my love. Jesus draws a parallel between our remaining in him and his remaining in the Father, a relationship that is characterized, in his case, by obedience. Remaining requires obeying. Abiding in Christ cannot be reduced to a subjective, mystical, inner state. The mark of an abiding heart is not only or even principally a sense of inward serenity, but it is a conscience clear before God and man. It is allowing Jesus' words to remain in us. You cannot be abiding in Jesus and have nobody around you be able to tell that you're a Christian. If you're abiding in Jesus, you're going to desire more and more what Jesus desires. If you're abiding in Jesus, you're going to pursue what Jesus prioritizes. I don't have time to go into example after example, but just one thing that pops in my mind right away. Did you know that Jesus believes you need a pastor? Ephesians 4 tells us that he gave us, he gave to the church apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. You understand that Jesus was, is described in the book of Colossians as the head of the church? It's kind of hard to do the things that Jesus commands us to do in isolation off by ourselves. Well, I don't have to actually connect myself to an actual church, do I? What if everybody takes that attitude? Where do we get to see on display the presence of God in this world? It's supposed to be in the gathering of his body. Jesus, we're told in Ephesians, loved the church and gave himself for it. You abiding in Jesus without a church? How does that work? Just one example. Be many. You're abiding in Jesus and don't care about reaching out to somebody else to tell them the gospel. Jesus came to get you. You're not interested in getting anybody else? Really? How's your abiding? Jesus was confronted by temptation in the wilderness and the, and, and the, the evil one tested him and, and Jesus said to him, it's written that man should not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I don't need to spend any time in the Bible though. I'm abiding in Jesus. I don't open the word. I'm abiding in Jesus. I don't pray. I'm abiding in Jesus. I don't have any vital connection to another believer in Jesus Christ. I'm not seeking to follow anybody that's following Jesus, and I'm not seeking to lead anybody else to follow me following Jesus, but I'm abiding in Jesus. Really? How's your abiding? There's going to be fruit. How's your abiding? how's, How's your asking? How's your asking? The fruit in the vine imagery we read earlier represents everything that's the product of effective prayer in Jesus' name, including obedience to his commands, experience of Jesus' joy, love for one another, and witness to the world. Is that what you pray for for you? Is that what you pray for your pastor? Is that what you pray for the people in your church? Is that what you pray for other believers? Are you praying for those things? How's your asking? Uh, Miller pointed out as well some things that we, kingdom prayers, we, we seldom ask. We don't ask God to change other people. Either because we feel like that's too controlling or it's just too hopeless. Or maybe I don't pray for him to change other people because then I'd have to be praying for him to change me and that's too scary. 
Because honestly, if he's going to start changing other people to look like Christ, he's going to have to change me to look like Christ. And there's still a lot of world and flesh in here. And if he's going to deal with that in you, he's going to have to deal with that in me. So let's not talk about that. Let's just come on Sunday morning, greet one another, and go home. Let's not talk about that. Let's not pray about that together. Let's just make sure we have enough potlucks occasionally. So we're really having fellowship. How's your asking? Miller said, the great struggle of my life is not trying to discern God's will. It's trying to discern and then disown my own will. Once I see that, prayer flows. (laughs) I have to be praying because I'm no longer in charge. Either I see all of life as a gift or I demand that life have a certain look to it. Self, will, and prayer are both ways of getting things done. At the center of self, will is me carving a world in my image, but at the center of prayer is God carving me in his son's image. How's your asking? What are you praying for? What do you want to see God do? We need to apply this personally. We need to apply this corporately. Again, how is our abiding as a body? How's our asking as a body? How's our abiding? Prayer is crucial. One writes to the effective mission of the people of God. Sadly, the truth of many churches is expressed in a penetrating sentence in James 4 to you do not have because you do not ask God. And it's not that prayer is a magic charm which in itself ensures successful fruit-bearing mission. There's prayer and there's prayer. Jesus acknowledges elsewhere the possibility of vain repetition. But where hearts are set to conform to his will and open to share his yearning for the world, prayer's potential is limitless. In the work of mission, the church advances on its knees. Another said the quality of the fruit should also be noted in verse 16. Fruit that will last. Such fruit honors God. It's a mark of a worldly church and of a worldly discipleship when we are content with short-lived, quote-unquote, fruit that feeds the fallen appetite for praise but affects no long-term changes. There are those who respond with a sudden burst of enthusiasm and then die away. That's true, as Jesus himself acknowledges, it's a regrettable fact of human nature and missionary experience. But the fruit that honors God is the fruit that will last and bring glory to the Father and to the Son on the coming harvest day. That's the fruit that we have no hesitation to pray for. Pray for that. How's our abiding You know, I've been challenged recently as, as, as a pastor to consider what are you asking of your members? What are, what, are you, what are you putting in front of them, asking them to do? Are you overburdening people? And, and I got to thinking, what, what, what am I asking us to do? What am I asking me to do? What am I asking us to do? Just go over the last couple of years. Prioritize gathering. Prioritize praying together. I think those are things we can pursue under God's direction. Gather, grow, give, go. Said that a couple years ago. How's our abiding? Almost done. Stay with me here just for a minute. How's our asking? What are we asking for? What are we praying for? I'm thankful that many more are praying for that God will help our church grow. They are praying to see people come to Christ. Let's keep doing that. But let's consider why. One writer years ago said this, many pray for a revival. That certainly is a prayer that's pleasing to God. It's along the line of his will, but many prayers for revivals are purely selfish. The churches desire revivals in order that the membership may be increased, in order that the church may have a position of more power and influence in the community, in order that the church treasury may be filled, 
in order that a good report may be made at the presbytery or conference or association. For such low purposes as these, churches and ministers are praying for revival, and oftentimes, too, God does not answer the prayer. Why should we pray for revival? For the glory of God. Because we cannot endure it. That God should continue to be dishonored by the worldliness of the church. By the sins of unbelievers. By the proud unbelief of our day. Because God's word is being made void. We should pray for revival in order that God may be glorified by the outpouring of his spirit on the church of Christ. For these reasons, first of all and above all, we should pray for revival. My mind goes back to Nehemiah. What was it that caused prayer to well up within him when he heard that Jerusalem, the city that represented the presence of God, was broken down, the walls were broken down, the gates were burned with fire, and he looked around and went and toured and looked around and said, this place is a reproach, it's making God look bad. And we can't have that. We need to rebuild. And the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. Let's rise up and build. Why? So that people will think right about our God. I don't know what God's desire is for this church. I don't. Do I want to see more people gather? Yes. But why? Because we're surrounded by people that are going into a Christless eternity. Because I want to see people that I know linking arms with me around the gathered throne of Jesus Christ, worshiping him together. Because I want to see what we prayed in that song today, that God would display his power for people who need to see him to see it. That's why we pray. That's what we pray for. That God would demonstrate his power and glory in the saving of souls, in the changing of lives, in the transformation of people. Will that result in more bodies in this building? Maybe, and I hope so. But I thank God for the people that have been saved and are following Jesus that will never darken the door of this church because of the way God's used people in this church. That's a great thing because it's fruit for God's glory. As a body, how's your abiding? What is your actual connection to this body? How's your asking? What are you praying for? I understand Wednesday doesn't work for everybody. I understand that. There's work and there's schedules and there's driving at night and all those things. I understand that, okay? So you've got your own situation to work out and, 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 and work through. But I'm asking, is there an actual reason that you're saying it doesn't matter to me to gather with other people in my church to pray? I'm not accusing, because I don't know. I, you, everybody's situation is different. I'm asking you to ask yourself. Ask yourself in front of God. Is that true? Is there a reason that there's been no initiative in your heart and life to lead somebody else yet? Is, are there reasons for that? Some are good reasons. I'm still learning. I'm following somebody. But are you praying for that day when you're leading somebody else? Are we praying? Are we asking? The command is to abide. The invitation is to ask. Let's ask.